Hello everyone. This is going to be a pretty short lesson on human growth hormone. Uh, so human growth hormone, we usually do just specify that it is human growth hormone that we're talking about by putting a lowercase h in front and then a big gh, hgh for human growth hormone. So stimulus for its production and the release. So we'll see on the next slide uh, where it's produced, where it's released from. The actual site of production and release is in the anterior pituitary, and it's also going to involve the stimulus coming from the hypothalamus. So what is the actual stimulus? Well, it's not just one, it's multiple different stimuli. So kind of interesting, fasting is one of them that does lead to increased production and release of human growth hormone. So if we do take a look at these two graphs here, so our control normal day meals, three meals sort of spread throughout the day, and uh, we do see a little bit of a fluctuation, but the biggest peak that we do see here, if we take a look at the time, 0800 is eight in the morning, uh, 2000, that is eight at night. So this is, well, when most people would kind of go to bed, maybe between about uh, 10 and 11 p.m. And we see that's when there is the big peak. If we take a look at the fasting day, we can see much, much more fluctuation. So obviously the fasting is having a different effect throughout the day. But not only that, take a look at the peak. Much, much higher when we would normally see the peak anyway, which is after going to bed at night, than what we see on a day when there is no fasting. So yeah, sleep obviously is the other one here. That is when we do see the big peaks shortly after someone does uh, fall asleep. Exercise. So exercise, in fact, and stress kind of go hand in hand. Exercise is one form of stress, multiple other kinds of stress that we could talk about as well. And the graph at the bottom here, they show once again, after you fall asleep at night, where we get the big increase in the human growth hormone. Again, all kinds of fluctuations throughout the day, but also it does show in this graph here anyway, that we do have a big increase following a strenuous exercise in particular. And genetics as well. So regardless of any of these, uh, different people do have different abilities to produce different amounts of human growth hormone and it has nothing to do with environmental factors. It has to do strictly with what you are born with, with your genetics. So this is the picture here that does show the mechanism by which human growth hormone is produced. So up the top here, all in this area, that of course is the hypothalamus which is part of the brain. So it will be the central nervous system, the brain that is kind of taking in and processing the information and is going to have an influence on the production and release of growth hormone, RH is for releasing hormone by the hypothalamus. So circadian rhythm is your sleep-wake cycle and that's what we did just see is that shortly after falling asleep, this is going to have an influence on the production, the biggest influence in fact, on the production of human growth hormone. Uh, cord our stress, like exercise, cortisol, the long-term stress hormone that goes along with that, that's gonna have an impact. And the fasting, which I suppose you could also consider to be a certain form of uh, stress as well, but perhaps a little bit different because we saw that there were fluctuations throughout the day, not just after falling asleep at night. So it is in the hypothalamus where we have the first chain of hormones that is produced and that is the releasing hormone. So remember that the hypothalamus is producing the releasing hormones IH or the inhibiting hormones IH. In this case, we don't have the inhibiting, although we do have this other one here, which is referred to as somatostatin, but you don't really need to worry about that one for biology 30. So let's just kind of focus on the releasing hormone. So upon receiving the stimuli, that's going to cause the hypothalamus to increase the production and release of that releasing hormone. So what does this hormone do? Well, it is a tropic hormone and its sole function is to travel through the local circulation between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Okay, so it is specifically, it has it here, the anterior pituitary that we are talking about. So there will be cells on or in the anterior pituitary that are going to have a receptor for the growth hormone releasing hormone. So maybe this hormone here just as a representation, let's just say that it is a triangle. So it's gonna fit into that receptor on those cells 
which in the anterior pituitary, which are within the anterior pituitary, that are specific for spitting out the growth hormone itself. So growth hormone, kind of an interesting one. So it can act on its own, or it in itself can also act as a tropic hormone. So here where it shows going down to the liver, and here we would then have a third gland that is involved in the production of hormones. So in this case, the growth hormone would be acting as a tropic hormone, leading to the further release of the insulin-like growth factor. We don't need to be too concerned about that. What we really want to focus on is this one here. So in this case, the sequence is hormone number one is the growth hormone releasing hormone. Hormone number two is the growth hormone, and that in itself can have an impact on, well, various different things. The first one that it does have here, there are a number of different hormones that can increase blood glucose, can have an influence on blood glucose. So in fact, cortisol that it has at the top here, that has an influence on blood glucose, epinephrine, norepinephrine, thyroid hormones, all of those can influence blood glucose along with the growth hormone. But the big one really is, well, from the name, responsible for growth. So in particular, growth of your long bones, cell division in your long bones, cell division in your muscles. So this would be kind of the biggest impact of the human growth hormone. So there is the negative feedback as well. So on the left-hand side, it is showing the feedback. Here it's coming from the third hormone, the insulin-like growth factor. But let's just kind of ignore that and talk about the big one for us, which is the growth hormone. So here, if I just add something else in, we would also have negative feedback from the growth hormone upon the anterior pituitary. So not only would there be receptor cells in the bone and muscle tissue, if I just draw the receptor like this, and we'll just say that this circle is the growth hormone, not only will there be receptors on these target cells and tissues for the growth hormone leading to the growth of the bones, there will also be receptors in those cells in the anterior pituitary that we're producing the growth hormone. So once there is a high enough concentration of that growth hormone circulating around, remember the final hormone is going to regulate its own production. You want to have the appropriate amount, but you don't want to have too much, or as we will see, that creates some problems as well. So negative feedback, that hormone will attach to receptors on the cells in the anterior pituitary, and they just kind of say enough is enough, and let's turn down the production of the growth hormone. There may also be some receptors up in the hypothalamus and same sort of thing going on. If that growth hormone attaches to those receptors, then it would have a negative impact on the production and release of the growth hormone releasing hormone. <coughs> so what is the impact of the growth hormone? So again, the biggest impacts are going to be on the bone, on cartilage, and on muscle tissue. So what does the growth hormone actually do? Growth hormone is a protein hormone, but it is going to have an impact on the proteins that are present, the proteins that are active, and protein synthesis inside of the cell, and in particular, the bone, the cartilage, and the muscle. Also, what we would have is cell division. This is a little bit misleading here. So cell division is going to be taking place in the bone. It might be taking place in the cartilage, but in terms of the muscle, that would be embryonic and fetal, but as far as we know, further cell division isn't going to take place in skeletal muscles once you are, uh, once you are born. That's all the muscle fibers that you will have. Other effects of increased growth hormone, uh, increased fat metabolism, and again, that was also one of the effects of cortisol. So we have multiple different hormones that can have the same impact throughout the body. Um, increased blood glucose, again, very, very similar to um, another of, number of other hormones in terms of increasing or at least maintaining blood glucose. And because the target is the liver, this would kind of be similar to glucagon because glucagon also targets the liver and leads to an increase in blood glucose. Levels of human growth hormone, as we saw, they do fluctuate throughout the day, both in males and females, and they also change with age. So we can see, taking a look at the scale here, 
incredibly high very, very early on during the growth years. So the childhood growth years, the adolescent growth years, levels are really, really high. But then most definitely throughout the 20s, the 30s, we do see it dropping off. And um, after about 40 or 50, levels are pretty low. They don't drop much more than that. So most definitely around in this range here, a range considerably lower, way, way, way lower compared to someone that is much, much younger. So characteristic drop that we do see. This is the case with growth hormone and it is also the case with a number of other hormones as well. In terms of homeostasis, um, again, you need to keep it under very fine control. You want to have the right amount of human growth hormone. So in this picture down here, I suppose we could say that this is what uh, most people would have in terms of the normal amount of growth and the right amount of the human growth hormone. This prefix here, hypo, means low. So if the production and release of human growth hormone is too low, in particular during childhood, then that does lead to the condition that is referred to as dwarfism. And that's what it's showing here down below in the picture. Too little of the growth hormone being produced by the anterior pituitary. And again, there could be multiple different reasons for this. It could have to do with receptors in the anterior pituitary. It could have to do with a releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus, uh, typically genetic in nature when we are talking about something like this. The opposite of that would be hypersecretion. So whereas hypo is low, hyper is high. And if we do have excessive amounts that are produced, again, during those childhood years, we do have, well, excessive growth, which is referred to as gigantism. So unusually tall, and that's what it shows in this uh, third picture here, too much growth hormone being produced. We can also have this high secretion, not during childhood, but adulthood. And if that is the case, the ends of the long bones, the epiphyses as they are called, they have already fused. So in that case, the bones don't get any longer, the person doesn't get any taller, but what we see is a condition referred to as acromegaly, where we have a broadening of some of the bones. And typically that's very apparent in the hands, the feet, and the face. And in this picture that we see on the right hand side here, that would be an example of what it would look like if someone does have acromegaly, the one to the left would be this condition of acromegaly. 